Hi, and welcome to this episode of Technically Speaking. Today, we're gonna to be looking at dyno sheets and what it means when you put your car on the dyno to measure its power, then compare that sheet against your mates. Before we start looking at dyno sheets, we have to understand that power is not really a one size fits all sort of thing. If we've got a car that makes huge horsepower really high in the RPM, but has no grunt down low, it's not gonna be an awesome street car, won't be a great circuit car, probably will be an awesome drag car. Likewise, if we've got something that makes a fair bit of grunt down low and then nothing up top, not gonna be a very good circuit car. So we need to get a balance of torque and power in order to get the engine to perform the duties that your car needs to do. Another area that we need to look at is the type of engine that you're using. If you've got a four cylinder engine, that's not turbocharged, not supercharged, you'll end up with a high revving, something that's got a really low rotating mass assembly. So you'll rev the engine harder, it'll have less torque, but you'll have more revs, which is where the horsepower is gonna come from. Likewise, if you've got a, a big V8, that rotating assembly is gonna be a little bit heavier, so you typically won't rev that engine as hard, but it'll make more torque down low, resulting in more power. Which leads me to this relationship between torque and horsepower. So there's no magic there, it's a simple formula. Power in horsepower is torque times RPM divided by this magic number of 5252. I'm sure you're all going to want to know where that 5252 number comes from, so here we go. The first thing we need to know is one horsepower is defined as 550 foot-pounds per second. So to get torque from horsepower, we need the per second term. You get that by multiplying the torque by the engine speed. But engine speed is normally referred to in RPM, revolutions per minute. Since we want it per second, we need to convert RPMs to something per second. The seconds are easy. We just divide by 60 to get from minutes to seconds. Now, what we need is a dimensionless unit for revolutions, a radian. A radian's actually a ratio of the length of an arc divided by the length of a radius. So the units of length cancel out and you're left with a dimensionless measure. You can think of a revolution as a measurement of an angle. One revolution is 360 degrees of a circle. Since the circumference of a circle is, well, two times pi times radius, there are two pi radians in a revolution. To convert revolutions per minute to radians per second, you multiply RPM by two times pi divided by 60, which equals 0.10472 radians per second. This gives us the per second we need to calculate horsepower. So let's put this all together. We need to get horsepower, which is 550 foot-pounds per second, using torque in pound-feet and engine speed in RPM. If we divide the 550 foot-pounds by the 0.10472 radians per second, which equals 5252. So if you multiply torque in pound-feet by engine speed in RPM and divide the product by 5252, RPM is converted to radians per second and you can get from torque to horsepower, from pound-feet to foot-pounds per second. And that's how it's done. Easy, right? So that's enough of the theory of how power and torque work. So let's have a look at some real-life dyno sheets, have a look at the power and the torque that these engines make and figure out which car would be the best to drive on the street, which would be the best to drive on the circuit, and which would be the best drag car. I've got four dyno sheets in front of me here and they're displaying the power versus road speed in fourth gear or one to one in each of these cars. This gives us a bit of a level playing field to compare power and torque versus the road speed of the car, not so much the engine RPM. The four cylinder aspirated engine, if we look over to the left here, I'm gonna use 100 kilometers an hour. So fourth gear or one to one at 100 kilometers an hour when we put our foot down in this four cylinder aspirated motor, it makes say about 130 kilowatts at the wheels. And if we come down to our torque, it makes about 550 newt meters. This would be a pretty nice, pretty torquey engine to drive. Knowing at hundred kilometers an hour, when you put your foot down, it's got over hundred kilowatts at the wheels. Flat out, this motor made 165 kilowatts. So that's your brag number that you tell your mates, but that brag number's happening right at the top for a very, very short amount of time 
at about 130 kilometers an hour. So first of all, if this was a street car, you're not typically revving it this hard all the time. So when you take off from a set of lights, you're accelerating from 1,000 to say 4,000 RPM, something like that, and changing gears. So where you're operating that engine is right around there, around that sort of 60 to 100 kilowatts all the time. Make sense? If we come along to this next dyno sheet, our Turbo 4, this one makes a total of 330 kilowatts at the wheels. This was a turbocharged SR20. But have a look at this. This thing's got a big turbocharger on it. At 100 kilometers an hour, the thing's only making about sort of 50 kilowatts and the torque is so low that the dyno actually doesn't measure it too well. So we're, we're right down at about 120 or 130 newt meters of torque. But if we come up to 180 kilometers an hour in fourth gear, the thing is now making 300 kilowatts. Where we're driving this car all the time is in this area here, where it's making somewhere between 35 and 80 kilowatts at the wheels. Now, looking at this sort of power compared to our aspirated four cylinder, if we were driving the thing off boost, I'd much rather be driving the four cylinder aspirated engine all day. The thing would drive so much nicer, it would accelerate faster to 60 and 80 and 100 kilometers an hour. Whereas the turbo four cylinder here that's got all that boost lag would take quite a long time. It would be fairly lazy, but when it does come on boost, it'd be an absolute adventure. So keeping in mind, yes, we, we talk about race car stuff all the time, but we do a lot of street cars as well. So being a street car, we need to have that nice trade off of all the top end power, but we do want to have a bit of grunt down low so the cars drive really nice in traffic. When we move up in the cylinders, this next sheet is a turbo six cylinder. This was actually an R32 GTR Skyline with an RB26 engine. This one at the top makes 530 kilowatts. Again, your brag number. Down low at 100 kilometers an hour, it makes about 80 or 90 kilowatts at the wheels and it's got somewhere around 300 newt meters of torque. So when we compare that back to our first aspirated four cylinder, that was the, the very first one I spoke about, which is actually a K24 Honda engine. If we come back to this one and start having a look here, so 100 kilometers an hour, it's got 120 kilowatts or so, give or take, and it's got about sort of, you know, 450 newt meters of torque. The Turbo 6 here, the, the R32, 100 kilometers an hour, it's got nearly 100 kilowatts and it's got 330 newt meters of torque. So even at that 100 kilometers an hour point, our aspirated four cylinder engine is actually making more power there. But then over here, the second that this thing comes on boost, away we go and it's making a huge amount of power. It would come on super, super strong. It needs to in order to get from at 120 kilometers an hour, it's making 200 kilowatts. At 140 kilometers an hour, it's making 450 kilowatts. It's almost doubling the power output in such a short span. So this, even though it's quite laggy, when it comes on, it would feel absolutely amazing. Up the top here, it does make that power for a long time. So it's making over 400 kilowatts for all of this range here from 140 kilometers an hour to 180 kilometers an hour. This is another really important thing to talk about when we talk about like peaky power, where if it's something that's got a huge, huge turbocharger, you could be making a thousand kilowatts at the wheels, but it might actually make 200 kilowatts, for example, until it comes on boost at 7,000 RPM and you'll make your thousand kilowatts between 7,000 and 8,000 RPM. That's fine as long as you've got a gearbox or a gearing system in order to keep that engine in its operating band in order to perform whatever you're doing. So in that style, of, I'm going to assume that would be a drag car. We would need to make sure that we've got the right gearing in order to operate that engine in its power band across that thousand kilowatt, thousand RPM range. And that's where the magic of drag racing comes in is we need to make sure we've got enough gears and enough ratios in order to launch the car, in order to come up to that RPM band, then hold it there. And the last dyno sheet is from an aspirated LS V8. I'd be doing a disservice if I didn't put an LS engine in here. 
This thing is an absolutely stock standard 6.2 with a stock camshaft. It's making 258 kilowatts at the wheels with a peak torque value of 840 newt meters. What you'll notice different about this one is that right down here at the very start of the run, the big capacity V8 engine is already making 120 kilowatts. Then, no matter when you put your foot down, it's making somewhere between 120 and 260 kilowatts. But the shape of the curve here is so different to all the others. It's close to the four cylinder one, interestingly, where the V8 has got a huge amount of area under the curve, under this bit here. And you might have heard that when you've been around the dyno, people saying, oh, I want, I want as much area under the curve as possible. And what that means is that we want the power line to start as high as possible and finish as high as possible. We're not typically looking for that outright number, the, the big banger brag number. And the reason for that is because if you're only ever driving that car in that lower area, so let's say you're only ever driving that car between 2000 and 5000 RPM. Well, if you were driving this Turbo 6 or this Turbo 4 between 2000 and 5000 RPM, you'd only ever be making, let, let's say, you'd only be making 100, 150 kilowatts at the wheel, something like that. In this LS engine, if you're driving from 2000 to 5000 RPM all the time, you would always be making somewhere between 120 and 260 kilowatts. On the V8, if we look at the torque down the bottom here, we'll notice that when we start the run, the thing's making a little bit over 600 newt meters already. Whereas on our four cylinder engine, 550 newt meters was the maximum that we, the maximum torque level that we reached. Uh, on our turbo four cylinder engine, the maximum torque that we reached was 450 newt meters. So already, as soon as you put your foot down, this V8 is making more grunt. It is making more torque at a lower RPM than all the other engines. We know that because from the seat of the pants, when you drive a V8 car, you know that when you put your foot down, it's got more grunt down low, but like they say, they typically run out of legs up top, meaning that we don't rev them as hard because they're a bigger engine, a bigger rotating assembly, things are heavier, unless it's obviously a very, very, uh, very fancy engine. And imagine if we just slapped a couple of turbochargers on that. Immediately, we'd have that low end torque and we'd have that top end power. Can't beat cubes. And remembering that while your car's on the dyno, it's not just to get that power readout, unless you're just there for a health check. When we're actually tuning these cars, what we're really looking at is this torque at the wheels. So in order to do that, we put the car on the dyno, we hold a certain throttle position, so a certain amount of airflow through the engine, then we adjust the ignition timing and we adjust the fueling in order to make the most torque at the wheels across all of the RPM sites. Knowing that we're making the most torque at that RPM site means that we'll be making the most horsepower at that RPM site so that we get the most area under the graph and we raise that whole power curve up as much as possible. But keep in mind as well, tuners aren't magicians. So for example, we'll never be able to get this 2.4 litre four cylinder engine to be making the same amount of torque as this V8 engine simply by tuning. There's, there is always a limit. And in that four cylinder engine, we would need mechanical modifications to be able to bring that torque up past what the best we can get out of it is with tuning, ignition timing, fueling, uh, maybe variable cam control. So by adjusting the inlet and exhaust camshaft positions, uh, if it's a, a Honda or Toyota or something where it's got like the VTEC style lift. So basically by adjusting our camshaft lift and our camshaft duration, we can change when the torque happens. We can adjust how much torque comes in, but there's always a limit. Now circling back to the very beginning, horses for courses. Which engine's gonna suit you? Which one would you want to be driving depending on what you're doing? Well. We could always just say straight away, oh, well, the V8, it makes the most torque. It would be driving really great down low, but it doesn't have the same high-end horsepower as the Turbo 4 or the Turbo 6. So that V8 would be fantastic for towing a caravan, towing a load of rubbish to the tip, driving in traffic at low speeds and having enough grunt all the time to pull out and immediately overtake. 
but that horsepower there, it's not going to run a, a fantastic quarter mile time. Whereas if we come back to the turbo four cylinder or turbo six cylinder engines that are making 530 kilowatts or 330 kilowatts, these two would be a lot better as a drag racing style engine because they're making a huge amount of power up top, whereas down low, you can still keep them as relatively drivable cars. Admittedly, neither of these would drive too amazingly on the street. If you're more of a fan of circuit racing, you might want to be looking at this 2.4 litre Honda four cylinder. Yes, it's not making 500 kilowatts, it's making 165 kilowatts, but not overly stressed making that amount of power, meaning that it's going to make that power forever, lap after lap after lap. I wouldn't want to be taking a 530 kilowatt RB circuit racing. It would have to be screwed together bloody well to live out the day and drive back onto the trailer. This 165 kilowatt four cylinder engine also has the benefit of the power being relatively smooth to come in and a relatively flat torque curve, meaning that whenever you put your foot down, instead of the torque coming in and spinning you around a corner, you'll basically know about how much power the car has at any particular throttle position, meaning that that driver has full control over that engine and can put just the right amount of power in in order to ensure that the car maintains road speed through each corner, which is the name of the game in circuit racing. It'd be a whole lot trickier to be doing that with a turbo four or turbo six cylinder engine with a huge turbocharger making massive horsepower. In saying that, in circuit racing, there is a good reason why LS and the Honda engines turn up to so many days. If we look across to the LS graph, the torque is relatively flat, the power is nice and smooth. So if you can fit a V8 in your circuit car, go crazy with a stock LS and the thing will go forever. If you've got a K24 in one of your circuit cars, likewise, awesome control over the throttle, the thing will last forever and it'll make really good torque to be performing that job. If you're using an everyday car that you're just driving to the shops and doing all that sort of stuff, yes, it would be amazing to have this V8 with all of this torque and all this power, but again, more trade-offs and fuel economy is that trade-off. So if you don't need to have that 130 kilowatts every time you touch the throttle at two and 3,000 RPM, the trade-off would be to go to something like a smaller capacity engine, which doesn't make that much power, but down low with the weight of cars now, you don't need that much power in order to drive around in traffic. And again, keep in mind, I know that our whole job is to work on performance cars, but there is such a huge, huge industry in modifying our factory street cars that I just want to be clear that each one of these torque curves do a different thing for a different job for a different style of car. And yes, I completely agree that a twin turbo V8 making 1200 newton meters of torque and 800 kilowatts would be the ideal street car all the time, except for all the trade-offs that we've already spoken about. We'll be doing a transcription of this video and putting it on our website, along with copies of all these dyno sheets. So if you are curious about anything on these particular sheets, jump on the website, you can download a copy of all of these, go through them step by step and see what power and what torque at what road speeds. Um, we'll also leave somewhere there so that you can upload your dyno sheet as well. I'm interested to go through and have a bit of a look, see how many guys have got dyno sheets. We might even make some type of prize for the, the weirdest or craziest looking power and torque, depending on whatever your engine you've got. And like always, thanks very much for watching. My name's Scott, and I'll catch you next time. <laughs>